everybody and welcome to another Wednesday video. This week we're going to be going through the stages of repairing a damaged warship. This was voted for by the fine folks over on Patreon and well it's not possible to encapsulate every single way of repairing every single form of damage to a warship and for the period the channel covers the operations to do so could vary wildly considering we're talking everything from pre-age of sail all the way up to the end of world war ii but based on the most commonly covered ships on the channel we're going to look at the repair of a damaged warship from roughly the world war one world war ii period so the age of steel the age of steam the age of dreadnoughts and we're going to assume that the ship is a relatively basic gun-based vessel, so a large cruiser or a battleship. There are a few minor differences that would occur with things like aircraft carriers and also at the smaller end with things like destroyers and sloops. So this seems like a comfortable medium in which to sit. We will, of course, make reference to a few carriers and smaller vessels that were damaged as case studies or minor details but primarily we're looking at your standard world war one world war two vessel and a lot of the notes for this are actually taken from the damage repair and then subsequent refit notes for hms belfast which is actually a reasonably good way of looking at major damage on a warship but obviously also taken from other vessels that have experienced other forms of damage because of course Belfast when she went into her, re her reef it had a lot of structural and underwater damage not a tremendous amount of above water damage so with that established the first thing you have to work out when you have a damaged warship is what level of damage has this ship actually taken because it could be anything from you know we're a modernized or fully modern battleship and let's say in world war ii we've been hit by a 550 pound bomb and a couple of strafing runs from an annoying aircraft or two that'll have done superficial damage to the upper works but a 550 pound semi-armor piercing bomb ain't going to trouble the deck armor of any decent battleship in the world war ii era and similarly in world war one you know, you may have been attacked by a particularly annoying airship or float plane, which again might have done a few strafing runs, dropped a handful of very lightweight bombs. And that's kind of a best case scenario, unless you're talking about just splinter damage from near misses. Obviously, as things develop, you could have been hit by heavier bombs that may have caused more damage above the armor deck. You may even have been hit by bombs or shells that have penetrated your armor deck and exploded further down. And while we're on the subject of shells, you may also have shells that have impacted on your armoured sections and exploded, but the armour has successfully resisted, whether that be turret armour, belt armour, or whatever. You may have shells that have hit outside the armour protection or have penetrated the less well-protected portions of the armour protection if you're a distributed armour ship, mostly in World War One, And that may have induced flooding and instability, but may not be a significant threat to the overall well-being of the ship but you might also have had shells that have or bombs that have penetrated the most heavily armored sections of your ship through the belt into the citadel into the turrets etc and that could be considerably worse then you have to also consider how many shells or bombs or gun rounds etc have you been hit by because you know one shell that penetrates the belt armor and blows up in a boiler room and has knocked out several boilers i mean that's bad but that's not actually as bad as say being hit by 15 bombs and a torpedo or two because you've got to remember torpedoes do underwater damage and even if none of those have penetrated the citadel the amount of damage that would have been done to the ship let's say a torpedoes hit the stern and other torpedoes hit the bow it may actually be considerably worse you think for example of uss boise uh, hit in the magazines there's a magazine fire that's pretty bad that's a citadel penetration but when you look at something like minneapolis with her entire bow blown off which one is easier to repair well actually boise is going to be slightly easier to put back together again than Minneapolis. But all of this effectively triage is the first stage in repairing a ship because you've got to work out what do we actually have to repair first. 
Then you have to figure out how far is this ship from home? This might be a rather critical decision. If a ship is very heavily damaged and it is very far from home, it may not actually be worth it or even possible to get her back to a repair facility. And therefore a ship in that situation might end up being scuttled or just put into a relatively austere port for use as a spare parts depot. Whereas a ship that takes exactly the same amount of damage much closer to home might actually be brought in for repairs. And then there are further levels of this because, of course, if you are, let's say, a British vessel and you might be on the other side of the planet, but there will be some facilities of, in some way, shape or form available to you from the British Empire, whether that be Singapore, Hong Kong, Cockatoo Island in Sydney and Australia, Gibraltar, Malta, Bermuda, etc. Now, some of these facilities might actually be fairly substantial. But it's very rare, if not almost unheard of, that overseas facilities for any nation are going to be, at least in the World War I, World War II period, quite as comprehensive as the biggest and best home port facilities. Now, of course, if you are a mildly damaged ship, then those facilities overseas might actually be capable of repairing you. But if you're a very heavily damaged vessel, you might need to put into one of those facilities first for some patching up work before staging out for home. And it may even be a case that you have to stage through multiple facilities. So you know, to stop the ship from sinking in a few days, you might need to put into a relatively austere port, which is still better than repairs at sea, where you can at least get the ship vaguely watertight. That might then sustain you long enough to get a few hundred or a few thousand miles further to a better port, which might be able to make somewhat more substantial repairs, but not, you know, rebuilding entire sections of the ship, which then might allow you to stage home to a major port if your damage is that bad. And of course, you don't necessarily have to rely purely on pre-established physical harbours and bays and so forth with established settlements that might have been around for decades or centuries although that is preferable because, well, in the operational area you're in, those facilities may not actually exist. But, again, in certain time periods, particularly World War II, it is possible that your Navy might be have brought facilities closer to the front line and you might have to use those. The US Navy in World War II in the Pacific being a good example of this with multiple large floating dry docks, which they brought out into the middle of the Pacific, which is rather famously sparsely inhabited and also sparsely islanded and those dry dock facilities allowed badly damaged vessels to come in and get patched up enough so they could survive the rest of the crossing back to the continental United States and could also do a fair amount of repairs for lesser damaged vessels. So this is another factor that the distance and the facilities between where the damage has occurred and where the ultimate destination of the ship might be. And then the last consideration, again, this is before the ship's actually even reached any kind of port where repairs can begin in earnest, is has the damage control efforts that have been undertaken to mitigate the initial situation in and of themselves caused further damage? Because you, know, you might have welded doors shut or hatches shut to stop the f spread of water. You might have ended up with compartments flooded by water percolating down from firefighting efforts that in and of themselves were not affected by flood or fire from the initial damage. Likewise, water damage to components, chemical damage to components, um, areas where fires may have been allowed to spread in preference to them spreading to other areas. So for example, if you have a fire on the starboard side of your ship and you therefore might angle your ship in such a way assuming that you have control of it that the wind is blowing from port to starboard now that blows the flames further out and away from the vessel which is preferable but that might mean that some of the starboard compartments that weren't initially on fire are essentially being sacrificed and set on fire so just the initial damage report of you know bomb entered here, shell entered here, torpedo hit here and did X, that in and of itself may not reflect the full extent of what actually is going to need repairing in the end.
So now you know the full extent of the damage that the ship has incurred and how far away it is from a port that may be able to repair it, you can now start to determine what repairs can be done in which situations because of the ideally you want the repairs done as soon as possible because apart from anything that helps in improve the ship's survival chances as it progresses to the next stage of repairs now we have mentioned a few elements of this before but we'll go over them in a bit more detail now the first sets of repairs that could be done to a damaged warship are the repairs done by the crew at sea. So let's assume that the flooding, the fires, etc., etc., are under control. The ship is no longer in a combat situation. The crew may be able to conduct certain amounts of repairs on hand. They will have some spare parts. Assuming it hasn't been destroyed, they will have a machine shop. And so some elements of this damage can be fixed immediately. Now, that may just be a case of cutting away what's now useless dead weight and just ditching it over the side. It may also be plating over holes. It may be repairing damaged weapons and sensor systems so that the ship can fight its way home, because that may be necessary. You might be shoring up bulkheads to withstand the stress of proceeding at a relative degree of speed at sea towards wherever it is you're going. You may even have jury-rigged entire new portions of the ship. Again, referencing USS Minneapolis and some of the other ships at the Battle of Tassafaronga and other related actions. Large amounts of coconut logs are not a standard structural material for US vessels. However, it was considered considerably better than just making do with what they had on hand to pull in to the nearest island where they could get hold of such materials and shore up the bulkheads and in some cases depending on the ship even construct temporary structures external to what's left of the vessel in order to facilitate their continued journey home and even very minor repairs can have a considerable impact on long-term repair issues once the ship gets home because you might think oh well there's some machine gun and cannon round holes and some splinter holes but compared to the fact there's a you know a 20 foot by 10 foot hole in the side, maybe this isn't necessarily something we should really bother with. But if you've isolated the area of the ship that's being flooded by the socking great hole in the side, actually patching up those small holes elsewhere in the ship can save a huge amount of time later on because spray, storm winds, the rain, etc. If all of that starts to get in and infiltrate down into the ship through the small holes, or one, that can actually collect in fairly alarming quantities, especially high up in the ship, which can badly affect the ship's stability. But two, that can also further damage systems that were not originally damaged. So, you know, water getting into the electrics, uh, water getting into compartments which hold supplies, and this kind of thing. That is going to make both keeping the ship afloat on its way home and the subsequent repair efforts longer and more difficult. So even small repairs need to be done as soon as humanly possible. You might also have scavenging operations going on, whether that be, again, mostly for guns and sensors, but it could also be for generators, drive motors, hydraulic systems, etc., etc., not only for getting some of those systems operational in the event that the enemy who damaged you tries to come in and finish you off, but also because, again, in, in the interest of getting back out into combat as soon as possible, let's say your ship has two primary fire control directors up top, so you know your range-finding devices. Now, those might be radar, they might be optical, they might be a com combination, but if both of them have been damaged in the combat and they're both non-operational but you don't have enough spare parts to repair both of them, and maybe you don't even necessarily have all the spare parts to repair even one of them, if you can cannibalize one plus your spares plus your machine shop output to make the other fully operational, well, one, you now have a fully operational range finding and director system, which is good, and two, when you pull into port, you can tell the officials, well, we need one replacement system rather than two, and this is good. So that's a broad overview of the repairs you could do at sea. Then you might reach what well, you might term an austere port, i.e. it's a harbour, it's relatively safe, at least from the elements, but maybe there's not a huge amount of material available on hand to make repairs. So 
for an austere port, you wouldn't necessarily expect to have replacement 4.5 inch, 5 inch guns or 40 millimeter bofors or radar systems, etc. But you might expect to find at least some metal sheeting, timbers, tarpaulins, and this kind of thing in substantially greater quantities than you had when you were out at sea. Uh, you might also find, you know, food, water, basic machine parts, etc even things like grease and fuel. And all of this can be used to further supplement the repairs you've done at sea and to patch up things that perhaps you couldn't do at sea. So assuming we're talking about a ship, as we said earlier, with a massive great hole in its side, you may have been able to isolate the flooded areas and shore up the bulkheads around it, but nobody is going to be lowering crew over the side in rough seas with several tons of steel plate and trying to get them to spot weld things in place. Some efforts may have been made in the form of you know a canvas barrier or something, but that's not a long-term solution. But once you get to an austere port in relatively calm waters, you may be able to plate over some, if not all, of the biggest holes in the side of the vessel because you're no longer moving. Hopefully the waves aren't quite so large and you might have access to the steel plate in the size that you need and or maybe even a crane to help you lift it or a crane on a boat. So the austere ports are essentially there just to make sure that your ship isn't going to sink through progressive damage further on. You might then move forward to other ports as we said and that will essentially be repeating this procedure but in better and better quality until because of course we are assuming the ship has major damage, you get back home or you get to a port that maybe isn't in your home nation, but is big enough to make the repairs. In either case, you and, well, the Navy realistically has a big decision to make. If, of course, they can actually make such a decision, because it may just be a case of, well, this is the only available berth, you're going in there, at least for now. But let's assume that there is multiple areas within this port that can accept your vessel. How has your vessel suffered its major damage? If you have lots of bomb and shell hits well above the waterline, for example, um, so your upper works have been really badly shot up, maybe turrets knocked out, etc., etc. Now, this is obviously quite bad, but it's all within the capabilities of being repaired at a pier side, key side, wharf side, whatever your particular dock happens to be set up as, i.e. whilst the ship is still afloat. So if your underwater integrity is still fine and there's not any particular damage near the waterline, you may just pull the ship up next to whatever it is, wharf, pier, key, as I said, and then the heavy duty cranes, which with most dockyards will be there for fitting out, will be more than capable of lifting anything that needs to be removed and the repairs can commence there. Conversely, if there are serious stability issues with the ship because of water on board, whether that's from firefighting, flooding or both, there's serious damage below the waterline, mine strikes, torpedo strikes, shell strikes, etc., or at the waterline, that kind of thing. Basically, anywhere where the damage would, A, potentially encourage further ingress of water whilst the ship remains afloat, and B, be very difficult to access because it's either in or near the water, then the ship would need to go into a dry dock. And once the ship is in the dry dock, then obviously it would be positioned, the water would be drained, the water would then hopefully drain out of most of the ship, and repairs can then commence. So congratulations, your ship has made it home to a major port where it can undertake full repairs. Now, again, of course, we are assuming your ship has taken major damage and we're going to include major underwater damage to get the full experience. So we're assuming in this case that the ship has gone into the dry dock. Now, what, how do you repair the ship? Well, the first thing to do above and anything is to make safe any structurally compromised sections because the last thing you want is the ship falling over in the dry dock or breaking apart in the dry dock, because obviously now the ship without the water surrounding it is under even more stress. So any structurally compromised area of the vessel will need to be patched up, shored up, plated over. There'll be, have to be some kind of at least temporary, maybe possibly ideally long-term, but probably temporary repair to make sure 
that the vessel stays intact. And when the ship is pulled into the dry dock, if the damage is bad enough, this may actually be done with the dry dock still flooded or possibly partially flooded or partially drained, depending on how you want to look at it, in order to retain that support from the water whilst this initial structural compromised uh, section of the ship is made good. Of course, if the ship is in that bad a way, it may not actually have made it back, but you know we're assuming that it's made it back, but perhaps there's something that is on the verge of going, because this is another thing you've got to bear in mind. A ship may be able to remain afloat and make it home. There may be something that's sufficiently compromised within the vessel that there's a decent chance of the ship breaking up at any moment. And indeed, in a few cases, this did actually happen, where a ship survived its initial encounter with the enemy, but would break up and sink on the way back. Uh, HMAS Sydney, for example, in the aftermath of its battle with Cormoran, USS O'Brien or O'Brien in the aftermath of its torpedoing at the same instant that hit North Carolina and killed Wasp. And of course, the stresses on that section of the ship are continuous. So just because the ship has survived this far doesn't necessarily mean it's going to quite happily stay intact without any further intervention going forward. But once you've stabilized the ship, if it's necessary from a structural perspective, the next thing to do, ironically, especially in World War II, not so much in World War I, but maybe sometimes, is to actually check for refit or upgrade potential for the ship, because that will dictate to a certain extent any actions that are going further on. Now, that may be upgrades in the forms of removing some systems to install others, say removing secondary batteries to install dual purpose batteries, removing existing fire control and radar systems to install more modern ones, or it may just be flat out installing new stuff. So you don't have many light anti-aircraft guns. Now you have lots of 20 millimeter Orlicans. You don't have radar. Now you're going to get it. And in some cases that may involve other aspects of the ship being changed, such as for HMS Belfast, she had bulges placed, but then as well as additional armor, but the armor was placed outside the bulges. So you, know, you have to check what if anything is wanting to be done to upgrade the vessel, not just return it to its original state. Having done that check, which hopefully will have been run in parallel with the previous incident, then you need to start removing damaged materials. So you might have shattered hull plating, bent up decking, broken components, anything up to and including burned out turrets, that kind of thing. You've now got to get rid of all of that. So some of it you know, if a turret's been hit and burnt out, then you might just lift the turret off. You might dismantle it if you can, but in either case, it has to go. For hull plating, this may be slightly different depending on whether the ship's been welded or riveted, but, you know, broken and twisted hull plating will need to be taken out. Whilst that major damage material is being removed, you would then recover also smaller debris, you know, shattered bits and pieces. Now, a lot of that may have been cleaned up by the crew on the way back, but there may be random bits, you know, shrapnel embedded in the side of the ship, fragments of the bombs, etc., or shells. All of that kind of thing will need to be recovered and removed because you don't need that around anymore. Not that you ever did. And removing this amount of material, which of course may even include things like damaged or destroyed boilers or other parts of the machinery deep in the ship, this is going to change the weight of the vessel and its balance, not just in terms of its balance in the dry dock itself, which could be a problem, but also where the stresses are located on the vessel. So you may have already made safe the compromised areas of the hull, but you're now as an ongoing process during the removal of the damaged material, going to have to be continuously stabilizing the hull to make sure that, again, it doesn't roll over or collapse in the dry dock. And also that, you know, if there were stress points which you have made safe, if those stress points may now have moved because you've taken bits off, you need to make sure that these other areas are not badly affected. So you're now taking off all the stuff that's at fully broken. Now to commence repairs, you have to cut back further to points where you can actually join new material on. And this can be everything from hull plating and hull girders all the way down to wiring. Because again, let's take an example very easy of wiring. Let's say you have something like an electrical distribution bus. 
a uh, nice big chunky thing that's been hit by fragments shorted out by water burned by fire whatever so it, it's dead so you've cut it out and removed it and a new one's going to come in great fantastic however of course this thing was wired up to lots of stuff in the interests of efficiency and just getting the thing out you will have cut off the wiring that both is coming in and going out of it pretty close to it now you could try and wire its replacement into this existing wire but you've now got a wire run or multiple wire runs that are cut part way along now splicing those together fine it could be done but it's not necessarily best practice so at that point you would want to trace the wire to its next junction wherever that happens to be and remove that whole section of wire now that section of wire is too short for this particular use but maybe that can go on to be used in other areas where it doesn't need to be quite as long it can be used in other ships whatever but you would ideally want to replace that section of wire with a whole new section even if 90 percent of that bit of wire is actually undamaged of course wartime exigencies you may need to splice it together but it's not brilliant more uh, importantly when it comes to structural elements if say you have a 20 foot long steel girder and at one end of it it's been blasted and twisted and warped but you cut off say 10 foot of it and the remaining 10 foot is actually good steel again you could try and weld a, another 10 foot section of girder onto it but you are creating a weak point along that girder it's better at that point to remove the entire girder and replace it with a whole new entire girder and the same thing with hull plating you know if you've got a 40 foot by 40 foot section of hull plating which is probably slightly large but nonetheless and there's a 10 foot by 10 foot hole in one end you could patch and plate it over but again in an ideal world you would just want to replace the entire plate so now you've taken the ship back as far as you're likely to do in this repair job now you actually start making the repairs so smaller damage machine gun rounds cannon rounds splinters that kind of thing you know if you've got again let's say on the superstructure maybe there's a 15 foot by 10 foot section of plate and the only damage is you know a two inch by one inch splinter hole through it there's no point taking off that entire thing it's not armor plate it's not structural you can just put weld or rivet a little spot plate over it and job's done you know the the thing is sealed it's got as much protection as it ever did plate over the smaller damage meanwhile further down in the ship the structural level repairs will commence so that'll be replacing of girders as we just mentioned replacing of whole sections of plating um, further up if your turret was dead then you might be putting in an entire new turret system um, or if a gun got broken into obviously we would have to take the roof off of the turret remove the entire gun now a new gun is going back in um, obviously at this point if you were going to modernize and update the superstructure all of that would be being done but that's not really a repair that's just part of the upgrade that has been allowed by the fact the ship's back in dry dock and through all of this you are going to be rechecking the hull continuously to look for warping um, changes of balance etc etc now in some very very specific cases you will also during this early process have some rather complicated engineering going on even above and beyond normal ship repairs uh, so with hms belfast for example her keel was very badly bent by the mine explosion and when she was brought in the entire ship obviously above where the mine had gone up had bent upwards and in order to facilitate the ship re-entering service she was actually at first dry docked in a way with the dry dock block such that supported her current hull shape which was of course warped but then once they had done the initial bits where we talk about you know removing the damaged material and so forth and they'd started in on some of the initial repairs she was then allowed to settle so that meant cutting back the dry dock blocks using her original plans so that the dry dock blocks reflected the, the ship's hull as it should be and that meant of course that the area of the ship that had buckled up was now unsupported and the sheer amount of weight involved several thousand tons began to bend the hull back towards its original position and obviously bend the keel as well and that had to be checked every day 
for weeks on end as the ship gradually settled back into what its original hull shape should have been. And then further repair work could go on because, for example, if you are going to be fitting a bulge, as they did on Belfast, or new armour plate, replacing armour plate, etc., even hull plating, you're not going to want to do that when the hull is warped out of shape. You're going to have to wait until the hull is actually back into the correct shape before you continue with the repairs. So now your major structural repairs are done and your really minor damage has been patched up. Now you can start replacing components. So if you'd had to replace boilers, turbines, that kind of thing, that would all have been done under the vague heading of larger structural repairs. But now things like generators, the power distribution bus we mentioned earlier, boats, aircraft, radar, range finders, all of this individual elements of the vessel that might have had to have been removed, everything down to you know, switches and relays, etc. All of this can now be replaced. And that's not to say that you couldn't have replaced those things earlier, but simply that once the ship has been fully stripped down to its minimal state, as we mentioned earlier, that is the most ideal time to start bringing in all the big heavy stuff because there's the absolute minimum amount of stuff in the way. Whereas if you have various smaller bits and pieces that have now been reinstalled, they and potentially also the people who are doing the installation may get in the way of putting the bigger stuff in. Depending on the Navy and depending on the time period, the one of the last parts might also now be the replacement or reinstallation of the really big stuff. So if you had a damaged conning tower or a main gun turret, that may come in at the end. It's also one of the things that's last in the fitting out stages of a ship. It may, as we've indicated earlier, have been done much earlier in the process. So if you're a ship with four or five main battery turrets and one of them's been badly shot up and needs replacing dropping that in and out may be done partway during the repair cycle but if you've got maybe three main gun turrets or you've had multiple gun turrets burnt out basically if there's a substantial portion of your main battery firepower that has been destroyed or badly damaged then putting the, all of that back in may be a latter stage process. But again, depends on the amount of damage, depends on the Navy, depends on the time period even. Because if you're in World War One and we're talking about a cruiser, a lot of those guns are going to be single guns, usually deck mounts. There's not that many turreted guns as a whole in the cruisers of World War One, and fewer still are twins, at which point, you know, if a six-inch open gun mount or something with a gun shield has been knocked out repairing that and replace or and or replacing it will happen pretty much whenever it can whereas if we fast forward to world war ii and you're talking about a triple eight inch turret yeah that takes a bit longer to make a new one anyway and it's a much more involved operation to put it back in nonetheless all your various bits and pieces have been put back in your hole's been straightened up the plating's gone back in the girder's gone back in you've rebuilt all the internal components passageways and so forth now you get to integrate all the new bits you might have installed because, of course, now all of the ship is there. So your new radar can be hooked up to check, does this work? And is it feeding the right data to the turrets? Is it feeding the right data to the Admiralty Fire Control Table, the Mark 1 range, find, uh, range Keeper, or whatever system you're using for fire control? If you've, say, installed RPC, Remote Power Training, or Remote Power Control to some of your secondary or main battery is that working correctly if we say you know turn the turret 30 degrees to starboard is it going 30 degrees to starboard is it going 29 degrees to starboard is it elevating properly etc etc once you think mm, everything's approximately working then given him that we've been talking about a fairly major repair job it's now time to recrew the vessel now, that may be an entirely new crew if your vessel's been in the dry dock for a year two years or so something like say west uss west virginia near enough isn't going to get a brand new crew because any experienced crew who were on the ship will have been redistributed to other ships long ago but you may also get a case both west virginia more particularly with something like belfast where a core element of the crew may have been retained because they have expertise on 
what the ship was like and how the system should go back together again. And then the recruiting may take place around them as a cadre of experienced people. But nonetheless, if you're talking about a ship that's gone in for very major repairs, chances are that the crew is going to be mostly, if not entirely, new to the ship. And of course, you have all these new components and repaired components, which means that when the ship comes back out of the dry dock, you are going to have to do a shakedown voyage. It may not be a particularly long one if you're in the middle of war, but you are going to have to do one because that helps the crew get familiar with the ship. It means that anything that you've installed that may or may not break once the ship's actually fully up and running and underway, it will hopefully break at that point and you can go, ah, okay, well, this is out of alignment, actually. This got knocked out of alignment and needs recalibrating. This has stopped working, so actually we need to pop back in and do a few adjustments and repairs, which, you know, depending, again, on wartime ex exigencies, you may be going straight back into dry dock if it's fairly major. If it's relatively minor and the crew on board know how to repair the things, they may actually just repair them, you know, as the voyage goes on but in either case you will end up coming back into port and going okay here's the stuff that broke here's the stuff that either needs fixing or that we have fixed and now in theory at least the ship is ready to re-enter service at which point the ship will be either sent back out with its new mission or if it has been in dry dock so long it was actually decommissioned it will have to be recommissioned and then sent back out into the wild blue yonder so that is a very short, comparatively speaking, overview and a very high level overview of how you would go about repairing a damaged warship, obviously with various breakpoints where we've noted if the ship was suffering medium or light damage, only part of this may apply, but we've followed the general route of a ship that has suffered some fairly hefty damage and then it goes into dry dock to get that repair done. For obvious reasons, given that these jobs take months or years and that each ship is obviously different, takes different damage, has different systems to damage in the first place, it's difficult to go into very, very specific detail about any very specific vessel or very specific procedure. But hopefully this has given you a good idea of roughly what you would be expected to do taking a ship through its full life cycle. If you want to know about specific ship repairs, such as, say, the procedure to take HMS Belfast from a mined cruiser that was very nearly written off, or perhaps even a continuation of the Pearl Harbor recovery series, because, of course, that series we looked at how the vessels were salvaged, but each of those vessels kind of left the narrative at the point they were sent off to the continental United States for actual refit and repair, Maybe you want to know about how West Virginia was taken from essentially a shattered hulk to being a fully operational capital ship. Those specific ship instances we can look at in a video some point in the future. And if you'd like to do that, then obviously let me know in the comments below and I can add it to the long, 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 long list of things that we have to look at. Nonetheless, thank you very much for listening, everyone, and see you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.